Everybody, the hour of 8.30 uh, having now arrived, I will call the meeting to order. Uh, can we please call a roll? Elliot? Here. Viziani. Aye. Here. 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 Kajewski? Covert? Aye. I mean here. And Rutledge? Here. All right, given that we do not have a quorum physically in the room, we will have to do our votes via, via roll call. Um, first item is the approval of minutes. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes from our August 18th meeting. So moved. Second. Second. Anyone? Second. Second. All right. Second. Any comments, changes, additions to that? Hearing none, seeing none, can we call roll, please? Elliot? Aye. 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 All right, those are approved. Um, chairman's remarks, um, I will keep these brief, uh, but we, I'm very pleased today to have Colette Holt with uh, who's going to present uh, on DuPage County's uh, program to create a business enterprise program. She's going to give us a presentation on the work that uh, she has done thus far, primarily with our transportation department and Chris Snyder, and the work that we anticipate will be coming up over the course of the next months and, and years. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, any public comment today? No. Okay. Um, with that, we come to uh, item 6A, which is informational. Um, I'll entertain a motion to place uh, the incumbent worker training memo for memory and energetic devices on file. Been moved and seconded. Kurjewski moved and seconded. seconded. And it looks like Mr. Kurjewski's there, so we can just do a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. That is placed on file. I will next entertain a motion to combine and approve items 7A and 7E. Uh, these are all related to the appropriation or approval of payments for WIOA grants. Motion. Second. Okay. Um, all in favor of approving items A through E, as in Edward, uh, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. All right, I'll next entertain a motion to approve item EDR 51920. This is a resolution uh, for financial commitment in support of the Workforce Partnership of Metropolitan Chicago in the amount of $14,000. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion on that? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, hearing none, item uh, item passes. With that, uh, Colette, there you are. Okay. Um, I would like to introduce you to Colette Holt. Um, for those of you who don't know her or know who she is, she is the principal of Colette Holt and Associates. Uh, she is a nationally recognized expert in designing, implementing, and defending affirmative action programs around the country. Uh, she has worked with DuPage County now for a number of months, as I said, with the Transportation Department. Uh, Ms. Holt is a graduate of Yale University, which we'll forgive her for that, uh, and the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, and uh, prior to being with Colette Holt and Associates, uh, she was Senior Attorney and Legal uh, Counsel for the City of Chicago. Associate Superintendent for the Chicago Park District and uh, an attorney with Schiff, Harden, and Waite. Um, I have to say I've uh, spoken with Ms. Holden a number of times over the last few weeks, um, and uh, she's been a pleasure to work with, and I, I think that uh, uh, she's going to be a great asset, uh, she and her team, for DuPage County uh, coming up. So, uh, Ms. Holt, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Chairman, and good morning to, uh, to everyone. And... Uh, Shout out, there's Chris, and uh, I saw um, my friend Greg Bedelov. We worked together, I worked for him um, when he was at the Tollway, and we did the, the Tollway's Disparity Study, so great to see him again, and, and thank you. Um, I'd also like to introduce Sandy Yano, who I think you can see there. Um, Sandy uh, worked with us on this project and has worked with uh, us 
for all of our um, disparity studies and program development in the Chicago area. Uh, Sandy has a wealth of experience. She was the uh, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Director at METRA uh, for 30 years and um, retired. Um, and although she is a, a deeply devoted Sox fan, decided that that was not quite enough to keep her busy all the time. So she decided to, uh, to start working on her own consulting firm. So we're delighted that she um, was able to work with us on this. And, and let me start out by saying um, thank you to Chris Schneider and Jim McGuire um, and everybody um, at the county um, for your help and your support um, and your timely responses to us. We really appreciate it. Uh, and it was great to work with you. We uh, look forward to continuing that relationship. So um, someone is my human clicker here. So next slide, please. All right. Um, well, I wanted to just start by uh, describing a little bit about what the pro project objective uh, was. Um, the county, I know, is very interested in ensuring that all firms have full and fair opportunities to compete for your work, um, with a specific emphasis on women and minority-owned firms. Um, and we were asked to come in and take a look at your current operations um, and uh, develop a pilot program for you. Um, while you consider your other options about what you might want to do uh, to ensure that um, all firms can compete for your prime and subcontracts on an equitable basis. So as part of that, we developed a, uh, a scope of work. We looked at documents. We interviewed um, county staff, benchmark what you're doing against national best practices, um, and uh, came up with some recommendations for you. Uh, next slide, please. So here are our tasks. Um, I think I wanted to also just stress that we, we wanted to take a look at your current contract um, and data collection policies. Because one of the things that, that we find across the country is that um, if an agency does not have some system to regularly and um, fully track who is getting its prime contracts and importantly, who's getting its subcontracts, it's very difficult to figure out how you're doing. Um, you know, you value what you measure and you have to have some way to measure it. So uh, you'll see at the end, we have some specific suggestions about that. Next slide, please. We also took a look at um, opportunities for community outreach. Um, I am a native Chicago and I grew up on the South side. I still own a, a condo in uh, Lakeview. And um, it was, it's been very interesting to see how the county has changed from when I was a little girl, uh, when you went out there and there were cornfields and cows and and, and this the demographic change has, has been enormous. So we think that you have some fruitful opportunities to reach out to the community, um, to the minority women business community, and develop those relationships so that people know that DuPage County is not only open for business, but is welcoming to them uh, and really wants them to participate um, fully. So we uh, developed a list of who those groups were, um, helped you prioritize those, um, and we're happy to, to work with you, um, Sandy in particular, this is one of her deep skills uh, in conducting community outreach. Next slide, please. And so of course, based on all that, we uh, wanna make you some recommendations and uh, that includes changes to your existing policies and procedures to increase inclusion as well as contract data collection. Next slide, please. So based on all of that, what did we find? Well, we certainly would recommend that you increase your outreach and your interaction with small businesses. And, and actually, let me, let me back up um, just a little bit about terminology uh, because people have lots of different terms and, and really these programs are kind of the alphabet soup, MBE, WBE, DBE, SBE, VBE, AA, 8D. I mean, it can get to be really quite confusing. So let me say what I mean when I say SBEs for purposes of this conversation this morning. Um, it really is minority and women-owned firms, um, veteran-owned firms, and, and other small businesses. Um, people sometimes want to call these programs DBE programs. Um, that's a term I think that's familiar to folks, especially uh, if you're in transportation and you uh, do work with, with IDOT as a flow-down agency for federal money. Um, but in the, the DBE program really is a race and gender conscious program. Sometimes people um, get that kind of mixed up and they think, well, if it's disadvantaged, that means it's not race and gender conscious. Well, it is. 
Um, and as those of you who are lawyers may well know, um, the courts really do require that you have extensive statistical and qualitative evidence before you enact any race and gender conscious remedies. And since the county has not conducted a disparity study, uh, you really are not in a legal position to have a fully race and gender conscious program. So for purposes of um, our work with you, we decided to call them all SBEs, just for sort of ease of, of conversation. But, but that's what we mean there. It's women owned businesses, minority owned businesses, uh, firms that may be certified as DBEs um, by IDOT, uh, for example, um, veteran owned businesses and local small businesses. So anyway, we certainly think that you should increase your outreach and your interaction with the SBEs. Um, and it seems that there are at least two fruitful avenues to do that. Uh, the first is working with the existing local assist agencies. Um, the Chicago area is really very blessed to have a strong network of uh, organizations that assist women and minority owned firms. Um, you go around the country and I, I'm still sort of surprised at often how little um, is really out there in terms of, of groups that can work with these firms to increase their capacities. Um, but groups like um, HACIA, the Hispanic American Contracting Industry Association, uh, with which Sandy's actually very involved, uh, Black Contractors United, uh, the Federation of Women Contractors, these are all great groups that are out there that are eager to work uh, with the county. Uh, the other um, avenue you might pursue is to work with the other area governments. Um, for example, the city of Chicago has uh, multiple outreach events, so does Cook County, the Tollway is very active, IDOT, they're all doing stuff all the time. Um, and we certainly would urge you uh, to leverage your own time and resources by working with them. Um, we do think you'll probably need to have some um, events that are very specific to your own contracting, but to get started, uh, there's plenty of um, stuff going on, a lot of activity, and the county can certainly become an active participant in that. Um, in addition to outreach, and really outreach is part of everything, um, we're suggesting you adopt an interim uh, race and gender neutral um, small business program. And this involves several elements. Uh, the first really is to create an office of diversity and inclusion, or you can certainly call it something else, business opportunity, um, different names, um, doesn't matter what you, what, what you choose to call it, but it really is tasking someone with responsibility for this. If it just sort of free floats through an agency, um, the, the programs aren't very successful then if, if they're no one's responsibility uh, and no one to hold accountable um, for the results. So we certainly suggest um, tasking uh, an office with that um, overarching um, set of responsibilities. Um, if you're gonna have a program, you have to figure out who's gonna be eligible for it. Um, and by develop certification standards, I, I mean decide whose certifications you're going to accept. Um, I, if you had any inclination to start conducting your own certifications, I, I would throw myself in front of you and beg you not to do that uh, because it's extremely resource intensive to do correctly. Um, and it burdens not only the agency, but it burdens the firms. Um, at one point, our firm was certified in 17 states. Um, and it is a full-time job just keeping up with that. Um, and so anything we can do to reduce the burden um, on these small and minority-owned firms, we should do. So we would certainly urge you to accept certifications, for example, from the DBE program, um, from the city of Chicago, Cook County, um, the federal government. Um, but you will have to decide uh, what your standards are going to be. Um, you'll certainly need to conduct outreach about the new program. Um, and that really is internal and external. Uh, it means talking to your, your staff, um, your officials about what you're doing, um, getting buy-in, um, but it also means letting the community know that uh, you've got this new program and that you're gonna move forward. Um, because again, you know, small firms um, uh, usually don't have you know, separate marketing departments and whatnot. You know, the, the owner's often the, the chief cook, bottle washer and, and the janitor. Um, and so um, they may not have time to just be trolling around seeing, oh, what's DuPage up to these days? So you really are gonna have to do outreach and let them know. And you will have to adopt contract data collection and reporting procedures. Um, how are you going to collect information from contractors about the race, gender, industry codes, scope of work, and all of this other data that we would need um, as part of a program and should you decide to go forward with the disparity study, you're gonna need that data as well. 
Next slide, please. We think at least early in the interim, um, a focus on reducing barriers to prime contract awards, um, it would be useful. Um, so for example, things like experience requirements. Do you have to build 10 of these in order to do one? Can you take equivalent experience? Uh, what about insurance? Um, we often find that um, insurance requirements are kind of on, on autopilot. Um, and you know, do you really need $2 million worth of coverage for a $75,000 contract? Insurance can be difficult for small firms to afford, even if they can get it, it's not cheap. Um, and so try not to ask for more coverage than you really need, if only because quite frankly, at the end of the day, the taxpayers are gonna pay for it anyway. So there's no benefit to anyone. Um, same thing with bonding requirements. Um, of course, there is the Illinois Public Bond Construction Act um, and you have to abide by that. Um, but um, there are some uh, creative ways uh, to at least uh, assist subcontractors um, with bonding requirements. Um, again, explore uh, partnering with the other agencies that are already providing support and technical assistance to these firms. Uh, the Illinois Tollway, for example, has a very robust supportive services program now. Um, I hear very good things about it, and um, that might be some place that you might uh, work with rather than try um, and provide um, your own. Um, I, we're, we're actually conducting the disparity studies right now for the city of Chicago. We just started Cook County. We're about to start the Water Reclamation District. And we, we've done studies for literally just about everybody um, in the Chicago area and in the state. And um, one of the things that the firms tell us repeatedly um, is that they need that type of help. So this is a very important component of a successful program. And then lastly, if you decide that you'd like to have a, what I would call a real MWBE program where you're able to set some goals, um, you're going to need a disparity study. And I'm, I'm happy to walk the law of that if, if anybody is, is interested at first thing in the morning. Um, but you do have to have a strong basis in evidence uh, and make sure that your program is narrowly tailored. Um, and you're going to need a disparity study to figure that out. Next slide, please. So what might that program look like? You'd certainly want to continue your race and gender neutral elements. Those are critical. Uh, the legal standard is that you use them to the maximum feasible extent. Uh, so you do need a robust race and gender neutral component to your program. Um, you're going to need policies, procedures, and forms. Um, this may sound a little daunting, but the good news about starting now is that we know how to do all of this. Um, and Sandy and I, between us, have more forms and standards and documents than you, know, than you can imagine. After 30 years, I have a pretty complete set of files. Um, you need to look at your contract uh, language, um, reduce burdens, make sure that you have a program language that explains to bidders exactly what's going to be required. Um, ensuring prompt payment. Um, you know, the very first question I ask a new client is, what's your net payment time? Um, and if you tell me it's more than about 45 days, then we need to have a talk about that because the program isn't going to do anybody any good if they can't get paid. Um, and we do hear horror stories about some of the other local governments, I will not name names, but you might know who they are, um, that take months and months to pay people. Um, and you'll destroy a small firm like that. So um, prompt payment is a really critical element of a program. Next slide, please. If you're gonna set goals, you need to use your data from the disparity study to do that. Um, the, the legal standard is that you, your, your goals have to be narrowly tailored, so that's important. Um, but it also means that your goals need to be reasonable and achievable, and that means that they need to be based on accurate information about who, in fact, is out there in the marketplace that can perform what you're asking. Um, you're going to have to train your staff um, and uh, ensure that they understand the objectives, how the program's going to function, um, and what's going to be required from them. You're going to need reporting protocols, presumably this committee or the board or, or some other body, depending on how you want to proceed. Um, we'd probably like to see uh, monthly and annual reports to track how you're doing. Again, your partnership opportunities. And then um, you need a schedule for periodic review. Uh, the courts are very concerned that these programs don't go on forever. So about every five or six years, give or take, um, it'll be time to think about a study update. Um, that's what we're going to be doing for Cook County and water reclamation is really updating the work that we've done uh, for them over the last decade. Next slide, please. You need to develop measures of what success means for DuPage County. Um, and there are different metrics you could use. 
Um, and different people have different ideas about this. Um, obviously, meeting your overall goal is, is, is one, but is it bidding uh, by more certified firms? Is it more prime awards? Is it larger contract dollars? Is it increased capacity? Um, but I, I think it's really important to determine what your metrics are so that you have something to benchmark yourselves against um, and see whether in fact you're making the progress that you'd like to see. Next slide, please. So what would be your next steps? Well, certainly start doing outreach and that's, you know, now. <laughs> um, that's a very minimal budget, you know, coffee and cookies. Well, I don't know anybody's gonna be having coffee and cookies together anytime soon, so it's probably even less expensive. Um, but that's a really very minimal um, expense. You're going to need to hire or assign some staff. Um, I don't know quite what that timeline might look, so I, I just put it into next year. Um, and probably the equivalent of about one FTE is what you're going to need. Um, you need your electronic data collection system. Um, if you get going, you could probably get that process underway um, in a couple months. My rough guess is it's about 50000 to procure, install, and train your staff on it. Um, but you'll need to, to get that from the vendor, which we do not do, let me be really clear. Um, and then conduct your disparity study, uh, which would probably take about a year and give or take about 350 for construction um, and related services by which I mean architecture, engineering, design, um, landscaping, those kinds of things. If you wanted to do all industries, it's probably about 500,000 or so for that. Um, it depends how many years of data you want to use. I assume that you want five years. Um, sometimes agencies do less, but that was my assumption. So I think that might be my last slide. Yes? Next slide, please. Yes, there we go. All right. So I'm happy to take questions or comments from anyone. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, and I, I'm going to guess that there's going to be questions from the committee. So does it, anyone... Show of hands, anyone have questions in this hold? Uh, Member Renahan. Julie, you're on, Julie, you're on mute. Sorry, I was so excited. Um, <laughs> anyway, just like that, thank you, um, Ms. Holt. I've definitely followed your work in South Bend and familiar with some of the things you've oh, done. Okay. <laughs> so excited um, that we are finally kind of going on this endeavor. I mean, 2020 and here we are, DuPage County is finally talking about uh, disparity studies and all these great things. <clears throat> um, you know, I looked, I had a chance to look at your uh, draft report, and then I saw the, the final report. And the first one mentioned um, something about uh, direct outreach with Hispanic communities that we've seen go up almost 60%, mm -hmm. also our black community since 2000, up, up almost 60%. Should we be directing outreach to say Hispanic communities or black communities, or I think we're up 45% Asian communities? I mean, mm -hmm. how does this work? I mean, how do we sure. take bites out of it? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that, that's an important um, point. Um, there certainly are groups to work with. As I mentioned before, there's HACIA, um, there's the Asian Contractors Group, there's the Asian Chamber. There are lots of groups out there um, that you can um, approach and partner with um, and get the word out. I, I do think it's important myself to have some stress on these groups because um, the counties, as I say, the county's demographics have changed markedly in my lifetime. Um, um, in lots of ways. And um, I, I think people may not know to go to DuPage County for work. You know, you have to kind of think about that. Everybody knows to go to the city of Chicago. You know, everybody knows to go to Cook County. Um, but I think that some specific um, stress there would be important. Um, I think you might want to be sure that people have access to some of your materials um, in other languages. Um, we, we did a project, um, a couple of them now, um, for um, Chicago Transit Authority and then Metra um, about um, Title VI compliance. That's Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And transit agencies in particular um, focus on making sure that all of their populations have access to information. So one of the things that we suggested both the CTA and Metra is, you know, they have these, these programs, now you just click and it'll translate into, the, into Spanish or or some other language so that people have easy access to materials that they understand. Now, I appreciate when you get to contracting, it's a little bit different. You're not gonna write your bid specs in five different languages. You're not gonna do that. But in terms of people figuring out that you're there, I really do think that some stress there would be, would be useful. Um, and Sandy, I don't know if you wanted to 
say anything about your work with Hasia and, and, and the kind of outreach that you're involved in. Okay, for the 30 years that I was Metro's DBE director, I developed relationships with all of these different organizations. We did list in the document that we gave you the ones that the organizations that are more the most relevant, but there are many more. And what has worked through the years, or when, well, actually, when I started at Metro, my tasks I thought were uh, certification. I oversaw our certification department and our contracting to ensure that we had DBE participation. And as the years went by, I had a, a third element to my, my position, and that was outreach. And that basically overtook everything else, was making sure that Metro was, that we were represented through the six county region, uh, that either myself or my staff attended the monthly or quarterly meetings of these different organizations so that they knew that there was a friend. Um, maybe someone didn't approach me one month, but they knew that the next month there'd be someone there from Metra. So it would be a suggestion that you have some type of representation from DuPage County at all these different events or monthly meetings. Of course, right now we're all doing things virtually. I'm, on, I'm vice president of the board of Hacia and we're doing our monthly meeting virtually tomorrow morning. But we certainly hope within the next five or six months that we'll all be doing things in person. So currently people are doing things virtually. So it, it gives, it would give DuPage right now a moment to organize itself, to start doing things virtually with the hope that maybe after the first of the year or in the spring that we could be doing something um, in person. I do understand, though, that a few of the organizations are attempting to do in person on a smaller level, like the Black Contractors, Owners, and Executives is having a small event uh, on September 26th. We're going to be doing at Hasea our second golf outing on October the 1st because they're small, but we want to make sure that people know that we're around. And like I said, there are many organizations, so getting the word out to all of these different organizations and having representation, letting them know that DuPage is here is a terrific start. While you're writing your program or deciding what you want to do, um, you can send somebody out. Right, and Sandy, Sandy speaks fluent Spanish, so um, she, 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 she's good at doing that. <laughs> All right. Thank you both. Sorry, Joe. I'm sorry. Go ahead. If I could just do one quick follow-up, um, just for a brief answer, so everybody else can have a chance. Um, but you said an interesting thing, Ms. Holt, in the beginning about we need to be uh, knowing who our contractors are and our subcontractors are. Mm -hmm. And you know, we often know who our contractors are, but in the end, we approve contract, we might not know who our subs are. Mm -hmm. So how do we how do we best capture that? Um, well, you you get a system and you require them to report. Um, Certainly all of the other, pretty much I think all of the other governments, with maybe the exception of City Colleges of Chicago, are already using the same system um, and contractors, you log in every month, and I have to do it because I'm the prime, so I, I sort of see it from both sides. You log in, you say, here I am, these are the subs that I listed in the beginning, and it has to be all of the subs, and this is something Greg may remember from our tollway disparity study time, um, is you don't have it now, don't look back. You'll never get done. Just go forward um, and, and, and let the consultant figure out how to go get the, the information. But you have to know who all your subs are, so you just tell them that they have to report it to you. They enter it into the system, sends an email to the sub so that the sub confirms what they were paid, and so you can monitor that. So at any given moment, if you, 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 you said, um, how are we doing with, with, with Hispanic plumbers? Right now, you have no idea. You may be doing better than you think, but you didn't ask, so you don't know. Um, and that's gonna be really critical because that's how you're gonna track whether or not you're meeting your goals, whether or not you need to continue your program, is by making sure you capture the sub data. But this is key. It has to be all of the subcontracting data, not just the certified firms. Well, wouldn't that be on the monthly invoices? Pardon? 
wouldn't that be on the monthly invoices that they receive from the, the general contractor? Do they list these subs? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, Sandy. I haven't looked at their data. My guess is that, for example, they aren't picking up suppliers, so it's not going to be complete. And, and I think to the extent that, especially, for example, if you're, um, like, say you have an engineering contract, we generally haven't asked for that. If you go and you hire AECOM or Jacobs, they send you an invoice and you pay if they did the work. You aren't actually asking them about who their subconsultants are. So it's that data collection that's really, really critical. The good news, again, for DuPage is everybody's already doing it. So everybody knows how to do it. So the contractors that do work for Cook County and the Tollway and IDOT are going to be the same people that do work for you. So they know the drill. It's the county that's going to have to get up to speed to be frank right. about it. Right. Hey, and I, I can and I can tell the committee. And sorry, Julie. Um, I can tell the committee that um, over the course of the past couple of weeks, we've had a number of discussions with staff, and I do believe that we are already in the process of putting together the uh, appropriate uh, paperwork to get the type of software program that I think you saw in Colette's last slide. Um, Chris can perhaps uh, fill us in a little bit later on that, but um, we're already taking steps forward on that process. And I apologize, there's, there's a lot of animals in this house and um, <laughs> locking them out, then they just scream. So they're just, sorry, there's some sort of activity back there where the puppy is bothering the cats. That's okay. I think I saw, Member Pacholsky, did you have a question? You know what? Tim, can I just ask one? Because I got to go to public works at nine o'clock. Sorry, so, remember, Don, uh, Brian, could okay, you speak and jump the line? You want to go? I'll go next door. Go, go, go. Just real quick, and, and um, I saw on the project overview, you know, you listed the MBE, WBE, BBE, and I, I mentioned this to Chairman Elliott the other day. I didn't see DBE in that project overview, and then you mentioned later on that. Um, something about we couldn't do DBE or you didn't want to use DBE because we didn't do some kind of diversity. Um, and then I know San Sandy just mentioned that when she was at Metra, she made sure she had DBE participation. Um, and I think with DuPage, can we, I'd like to see us do more DBE because some of the MBEs are very large and they already know, can compete. Um, but can we set aside a portion, whether it's 20% of the contract got to be minority, but 10% DBE. Our projects are much smaller than IDOT, City of Chicago, um, Tollway, and I'd like to see more smaller firms, so more DBEs get that. But you made a comment about what wasn't in your project overview, we couldn't do it because of something. Okay, well there's a lot, there was a lot in there, so let, 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 me, let me unpack that for just a second. Um, when you're talking about, for example, IDOT's DBE program, that is a race and gender conscious program. Women and minorities are presumed to be socially disadvantaged. So the DBE program, you could call it an MWB program if you wanted to, the labels don't really matter because it's a race and gender conscious program. Without a disparity study, you have no legal basis to do that. So you can't have a DBE program because you haven't done the disparity study yet. You can't so have an MWBE program. Doesn't really matter what you call it. Um, so it's important to understand that without a disparity study, you have no legal basis to take race and gender into account like the DBE program. So does. we'd have to do that first to have the DBE, because there's a financial aspect of it too, because- the Well, there MBE, is. So this may be more law than you wanted to hear real quick, but, but just quickly, there are three components to the, to the DBE program to be eligible. You have to be a racial or ethnic minority or a white female, presumptively, although other people can participate. If you like, I can explain how that works. The second thing you have to be is you have to be economically disadvantaged. And that's a personal net worth limit. And the firm has to be small. Those are three independent um, and necessary criteria. You have to meet all three of them in order to be eligible. Because I would um, like to see us have more of that than um, a portion set aside for that than the MBEs, which have already graduated and they've, you know, their net worth's too, too large, but to give more opportunities for the smaller businesses. So I'd like to see us at least maybe long-term look towards putting a program in so we can do DBE for the smaller uh, businesses. Right, well, I, I, I think it's a, um, certainly from a legal standpoint, and I'm not here to really give you a legal opinion because I wasn't hired as your lawyer, but I will say this. In order to have a defensible MWBE, DBE, again, it doesn't matter what you call it, you are gonna need some kind of size limit anyway. 
So that, that kind of goes without saying. No government program should have deep MBEs or WBEs in it that are huge companies. If you get sued, you're gonna lose. So I, I, at least I'm, I can um, assure you that any program that you would adopt would have size standards, it would have some type of personal net worth limit, um, and it would be presumptively for women and minorities or, or other groups that might be able to come in. So that's built into the program. I know we already have a transportation, I was to say, we already have some large MBEs are, uh, that are participating that we get contract out to. Right, well in the DBE program, the size standards vary. They're set by the SBA, the US SBA. Um, and so we probably urge you to do the same thing. Um, do know at least that for this, uh, the MBE and WBE certifications for Cook County and the city of Chicago, which now have full reciprocity, they have a size standard and a personal net worth limit. So that's all built into those certifications. Thank you. And, and I, I want to, and I just want to make sure everyone's, everyone's clear on this. And I, I think Colette has been clear, but I just want to reiterate the point. We're talking really about a two-step process here, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the, the sort of robust programs where we can really uh, identify and target um, M MBEs and WBEs, that has to await the results of the disparity study mm -hmm. because we have to understand what the data tells us about what we can do before we decide what we're going to do. And that's that line item that I think was between three hundred fifty and five hundred thousand dollars as a projected cost in a 12 month time frame um, as a projected time frame on that timeline. I think most of what Colette has really been talking about has been while we're waiting for that disparity study to get done. What are the steps we can take now, yeah. right? And, and one of the steps is, is we can start focusing on our small businesses, right? We can have something that does not necessarily have race or gender as a criteria because we don't have those legal limitations on that. Mm -hmm. um, and we can begin, and I think this is what Sandy was mentioning too, we can begin taking the step we're gonna roll out the more robust program. We've already established the relationships with ASEA and with everybody else so that we're ready, to, we're ready to roll. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Once in a while I get it right. Don, I think you had a question. I had two, thank you. This Office of Diversity and Inclusion, that's a private and public sector uh, group that would include some of these groups that we're trying to get in the process, is that correct? No, no, let me explain, and I'm, I apologize if I wasn't clear on that. Um, no, this, is, this would be an office in the county. You know, like your other county department then, correct? Okay. All right, and my second, is this uh, diversity study, I mean, if I read Cook Counties, would it help me out? Or is, 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 I assume, is it component parts of a diversity study in DuPage different than what's going to be in Will and Lake and McHenry Counties or Cook? I mean, can you tell me a little bit about this diversity study? Sure, and if you want some good bedtime reading, because um, we have an awful lot of charts and an awful lot of uh, statistical stuff in there, but you could start with our, our tollway study. Um, and I'm happy to, to, to get that to the chairman, to get to everybody. I, I think it's probably still up on the tollways website, but just- I would, like, I would like one that's most relevant to DuPage County. So if you think that's the tollway, or if there's another uh, a client you had in the past, whether you're from Illinois or not, I would like something that you would think was somewhat similar to DuPage rather than the toll authority. So if you could do that to the chairman, I would appreciate that. Sure. I'm happy to send you the, the Cook County study. It's getting a little long in the tooth. Probably it, it's a different market, but the most um, uh, relevant situation is a, is a, a disparity study we, we just finished a couple of months ago for Harris County, Texas, which is Houston. Um, and they had no program either. Um, the city's had a robust program for decades, but the county had nothing. And we are in the process of writing their new program for them. But I'll send you that disparity study because it, it's the closest thing in terms of an agency that is large, that is complex, um, but that not that has not had a, a, a study. So thank you very I much. Send you more stuff than you want to read, but All right. Right. No, thank you. All right, Member Covert. Thank you, Colette, for this wonderful presentation. And I'm, I was just so happy to hear about all this information, the legal requirements. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot to take in and uh, very important. Um, I had a question about the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, we already have an office, uh, Greg, we have a, with Greg Bedelov, Choose to Page, an Economic Alliance Development Group. And I was just thinking, I don't know, maybe Tim, you can answer my question, or Greg, would it, 
or Colette, would it be, um, would it, would it be okay to set up an office of diversity inclusion within an economic alliance group or does it have to be completely separate from what we already have? Well, right you now? could, and I'm not, um, I don't know really quite enough about what Greg is, is up to these days. And I'm just so <laughs> delighted to find him again. Um, and uh, so we could certainly talk about that. Um, generally, it, it's a standalone office in an agency, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, I think we could think creatively about how to leverage the resources you already have and the work people are already doing, um, especially in what I assume are going to be increasingly tight budget times here. It, it's not going to be good for a while. So, um, you know, that would be something I would certainly be happy to, to talk with. And I know um, Greg understands these issues very well. Poor man, I, I dragged him through the mill um, when he was at the tollway. Um, and he's super committed to it. So if that works for you, that sure, why not? Let's see what we can make work that you can get going so you can make some progress now. More work for Greg. <laughs> <Just kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Member Elliot, Chairman Elliott and Colette, the only thing I would add to that, yeah, bring it on. I, I, as Colette said, we did great things together at the tollway and I would welcome the opportunity to try to do great things together at DuPage. Um, the only thing I might add to that, and because it sounds like the county, at least this committee, is, is thinking about taking a measured stepwise approach and doing small things as opposed to just jumping right in and let's say, let's create an Office of Diversity and Inclusion and put a disparity study in place and start hiring people. Uh, one thing that we did at the Tollway, Colette, you'll recall, is we also created a Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm which was a public-private partnership, as I believe it was uh, Member Pachowski said, where we had regular meetings with the, after the Black Chamber, with Hasia, with the veterans groups. They came with their feedback and their input, and we then provided, funneled that input to the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, which was a standing committee and still is a standing committee on the tollway. And then the Office of Diversity and Inclusion implemented those recommendations if the board passed them. So I think maybe an additional good first step would to just say to the diversity community, the women-owned business community, the small business community, as Member Krajewski said, get your leaders in a room with us and let's talk about what you'd like to see more of from the county. Because I, as Colette will tell Great you... Idea. Great idea. Great idea. As Colette will tell you, anybody who's ever, anybody who can tell time can build a watch, anybody who can drive a car can repair an engine, but not everybody who is a DBE or MBE knows the intricacies of implementing a program that is going to be successful. And I know we all want it to be successful. So just another food for thought. But you know what, That's Sadie? a great idea. Choose DuPage is more than willing to bring on any challenge and any opportunity. As Colette said, I'm passionate about it. I'd love to help. And, and Greg, I obviously appreciate that. We, we value and treasure Choose DuPage as a partner. Um, Sadia, I will tell you, I have some concerns about entirely outsourcing this particular function to outside the county. Um, I do want to be respectful of everyone's time today and and uh, particular our presenters. So I don't think this is probably the time to go into those concerns, uh, but um, we can chat about that offline. I, I did see member Chaplin had her hand up. I'm not sure if she's still on. I don't think she is. Does anyone else have any questions for either Sandy or Colette? All right. Hearing none, seeing none. Colette and Sandy, thank you very much. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you. And right. uh, we look forward to a, a continued working relationship with both of you. So thank oh, you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And we look forward to it too. Everybody have a good rest of your day. And thank you for your time and attention. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right. And with that, um, we turn to the next item, which is Greg Badalov. <laughs> Yes, and I will be very brief. That's a brief tough act to follow. Yeah, I'm not kind of like Greg. Something's <laughs> up. <laughs> so, um, real briefly, I wanted to provide you all with an update on where we're at with the small business program, and our recommended grant recipients, how much businesses have been awarded, where those businesses are located, and how much money we've deployed out of the program to this point. It's been a great pleasure to work with this program. Our team at Choose DuPage, our interns, Teresa O'Brien everybody else. It's really been fun to see something that the business community was craving 
and that the business community truly appreciates. So with that, if I could ask for the next slide, please. So to date, we, um, with, with the phase one, there was 598 businesses that were approved for relief grant funding. You'll recall in phase one, you all allocated $7 million. Uh, that 598 businesses represented about 6.5 million of the 7 million. We started to see activity slow down. We still have some businesses that are left in the quote hopper from that original phase, which will in all likelihood utilize the remaining half a million. And if not, that would be rolled into phase two. Phase two, we brought two batches in front of you. The first batch had 155 applicants, of which 152 were businesses, three were contractors. You'll recall phase two no longer has the PPP restriction or the COVID relief fund restriction. Uh, we, and our second batch was 209 applicants that are being recommended for approval. And I should let you know that our grant committee and uh, our grant committee just met yesterday. And the third batch will be another 298 applicants. So, um, you know, we're at 2.817 million out of these 209 that are recommending relief funding for this current batch, batch two. Phase one. So, Greg, may I, Greg, may I interrupt just for a, a quick question? Please. Is phase two, batch one, the 155 applicants, is that what we approved last week at the county board? Correct. Okay. Batch so, two is coming before you, and then batch three, as I said, will come at your subsequent meeting. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. It's okay. And batch one, I should let you know, was just over 2 million, the 155 applicants. Next slide, please. So again, for this program, um, we recall we had the restrictions of having received previous COVID relief funds. That's been removed for phase two, but the other pr parameters remain the same, 1.5 million in revenue or less and 15 or fewer full-time employees for a business in good standing with the state of Illinois. And if you're an independent contractor, more than 50% of your income must be 1099 work. Next slide, please. So of the 203 that are due to come before you this time around, here's a real quick breakdown. And this is pretty consistent across all the batches. 146 of them are corporations, 10 are sole proprietors, 41 are LLCs. We have our share of not-for-profits and our limited partnerships. Next slide, please. There's been a lot of questions when, we, when you all launched the program that was it gonna be fair and was it gonna represent businesses across the county in conjunction with the county's GIS team um, who have been absolutely phenomenal. I should let you all know that they've been tracking where these applicants are located. And as you can see, we have great representation from throughout the entire county. On the county GIS system is a link that can give you a breakdown on a town by town basis or a district by district basis. I didn't wanna include that in this presentation for time's sake and because I didn't know how many districts would be represented in the Economic Development Committee meeting. So if you want that, I'm happy to share that with you. Uh, next question. Or I'm sorry, next slide. Um, so this is interesting. Um, the average annual reported income in phase two, which again is businesses that may have received previous COVID relief funding is about two times what we saw in phase one. It's almost half a million dollars in average annual reported revenue and their estimated COVID-19 financial related losses on an annual basis are over $170,000. So phase two, long story short, bigger businesses, they've applied for PPP and may have gotten it already. And quite frankly, the applications are much more thorough and much more complete and much easier for Choose Be Page to administer. Next slide, please. Uh, the average amount requested from the businesses in phase two, remember we have a $15,000 cap and I'm really, you know, this, this warms my heart to see that businesses are asking for what they need, not just everybody asking for the 15,000. The average amount requested was 14,059 and the average amount grant recommended is 13,476. Next slide, please. For our contractors on this batch, again, there's only six of them. Um, and they've reported an annual income of 42,000 and they need the money for loss of income and other ser sunken service fees and expenses. Next slide, please. 
they're located throughout the county, but again, there's only six of them in this batch, so not much to look at there. Next batch, please, or next slide, please. They're asking for on average 6,200 and being rewarded on average just under 4,500. And I believe that is my last slide, but I do wanna, again, thank you for entrusting Tuesday Page to administer this program. Um, we, we've deployed all the money virtually from phase one. We're now about $5 million into phase two of the 9 million that's been allocated. And at the rate we're going, we'll probably have four batches that we will bring in front of the county before all the money is exhausted. Our biggest fear at this point is that we think we have more applicants than we have money, but we knew that could potentially happen. Um, and we have let everybody who is applying know that it is a first come first serve program. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Bedelov? Obviously, he did a great job and it was crystal clear in his presentation because no one has questions. Thank you very much. All right. And then last but certainly not least, we go to Lisa Shavak from WorkNet DuPage. Lisa, you are the grand finale today. Bringing up the uh, background of the presentation, I will be um, also extremely brief. Uh, first slide here, and I'll make sure everybody has a copy of this after the fact. Um, I don't know if it was included in your packets, but here's updated unemployment data. Um, I include that chart on the left to demonstrate uh, the temporary layoff component of this entire COVID-driven uh, economic uh, recession that we've kind of entered into here. As you could see in August, now the temporary layoffs and the permanent job losses, um, although the total numbers are down, there's kind of more of a 50-50 split uh, showing up here. We're seeing more permanent job loss as those temporary layoffs become permanent. Um, DuPage County, as of July 2020, as you're probably aware, is at 9.6% unemployment. Again, a lot of that still being reflected in furloughs and uh, temporary layoffs. Hey, Lisa, those numbers yeah. on the left there, the um on the upper left-hand corner there. Are those DuPage County or Illinois? Those are national. national. Uh, okay. uh, the, the grid with the temporary layoff is a national. Those are national uh, right. statistics. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Again, uh, I've been showing you the through IDS, the UI rates for the DuPage villages and cities that they provide data on uh, monthly. And again, you can see we're seeing drops, which is great. Uh, from June to July, which is the most recent data, we have significant drops there in the overall unemployment rates of um, all of the villages and towns represented. Uh, next slide, please. Our COVID response at WorkNet DuPage, as I've been keeping everyone aware of, um, one of the things that we're doing is really focusing on leveraging our um, resources and within the county, specifically the health department, community services. So we've partnered with the health department, was awarded grant dollars to cover the wages of 20 contact tracers. Um, we've had seven hires to date and we have 10 plus uh, that are in the interviewing process at the health department. What I really wanna draw attention to today is a partnership with community services where we're, we're pairing rent assistance with job training funding for people that are out of work due to COVID. You could see that postcard there um, on the right is the, the marketing collateral that we've been pushing out through the community. And if you go to the next slide, we created a, a page on our home, on our webpage um, there that's unlock sharing campaign to make this really quick and easy. I know this came up in the last committee meeting about how best um, people can help get the word out on this. If you visit that website, you can access everything that you need uh, to share on your social media feeds or in your newsletters or whatever other uh, methods that you use. We even included some suggested uh, copy there that you could just copy and paste into a, a post quick and easy. Um, also, if this is something that you would want to mention at a meeting or an event that you're at, we included some key talking points. So it's really sort of a turnkey solution. Um, and if you go to the next slide, this is a very small um, screenshot of what you will see when you go there. But if you expand um, when you visit the site on any of those, share in your newsletter, share on social media, it's just quick and easy, boom, 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 and you've shared out the information um, on our and the county's behalf, which we think is gonna be a really good tool for everybody to use moving forward. And then the last slide, 
Uh, as you're aware, we've been working on our own kind of equity and demographic study, looking at all of the uh, WIOA participants from last program year and doing some analysis of uh, what types of training programs or industry sectors, different groups of people are um, primarily selecting for training, what career pathways they're selecting. We're still kind of in the process of trying to boil that data down and get some uh, clear takeaways from that so that we can set some goals for how we're career counseling people. So I'll keep you posted on that. And um, we do have, based on data, identified some target towns and villages for this program year that we really want to see the number of residents from certain towns go up. Um, very few people, for example, served from Wooddale, from Hanover Park, uh, those are areas that are areas of need based on the percentage of residents that are below the poverty line and the percentage of residents who do not have a high school diploma or GD in those particular towns. And yet we're seeing a very low number of WIOA participants. So we're actively um, engaging with, with those specific towns to try to drive our numbers up of the people we're serving from those areas. Um, and I think that's the end of my presentation. And if there's any questions for whoever is hanging in with this call, I'd be happy to answer those. Pete, Sheila, do you guys have questions for Lisa? I'm good. Um, quick question on contact tracing. What, what kind of um, um, wage are they making, the contact tracers, and how long do you think those jobs will last for? So there's two levels. There are associates and specialists. The specialists are hired at $21 an hour and the associates at $18 an hour. They're 25 hour a week uh, positions all fully remote and they last for nine months. And then the health department, they are actually hired on as health department employees. Uh, the health department serving as employer of record, not a staffing agency or anything like that. So there could be potential for people to um, remain on in some capacity after the nine months. Okay, so if we have people that might be interested in that, send them your way or is there an online uh, application? There is, um, let me send, you know what, with the presentation, when we send that out, Amy or I will send out uh, my presentation. I'll send out the flyer for the contact tracing as well. And that can also be shared. Um, we have a kind of a special email account sign, uh, set up that people can respond to. Okay. Are those, uh, is that uh, uh, 25 hours a week? Are they, are they working on their own time? Or are they working like certain uh, mornings or afternoons or evenings? Or is there a, a time uh, window when they have to make those calls? I think that they, I'm not entirely sure how they're setting up the scheduling and they're hiring, you know, hundreds of people total. Um, I think that they need people for all parts of the day so that, you know, as you're trying to reach people who are perhaps at work or doing, um, you know, homeschooling or something, um, they need people, I think, for, for pretty much all of the time. So I think the hours might be somewhat flexible, but I don't want to say 100%. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Great job right. as always. Member Rutledge, any questions? Got nothing for you. Thanks, Tim. All right. Mem Good member Rutledge is our together. stoic member today. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, Lisa, thank you very much. Uh, you. Any old business? Any new business? Without objection, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Greg and Lisa, for your presentations today. Bye, everyone. Have a great day.